Hey, Hound Dogs, I'm David Hankins. I'm Paul Hankins. And I'm Trevor Hankins. And you're on the air with Power Squared. Uh, this week we have a special guest, uh, Stephen E. Gordon, uh, a well-known animator, producer, direct, I mean, director, storyboardist, character designer, uh, has, uh, has agreed to be on the show. And so we're very happy. Welcome, Steve. Thanks. Nice to be here. Good. Uh, so for those who are watching and don't know who you are, would, could you uh, uh, tell us about yourself? Uh, well, I'm best known as the character designer of uh, X-Men Evolution, a series from uh, 2000s, the early 2000s, and uh, the Swan Princess. I was character designer and animation director on that feature, which was uh, much earlier than that. So everything else is just kind of easily, you know, I've worked a lot of different places on a lot of different mediums and stuff, so. Where did you go to school to, to learn animation? I did not. Okay. I, I got the job while I was in high school, my first job while I was in high school, and then I uh, never was able to get back out to go to school. So. All right. <laughs> that saves a lot of money on student loans. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, I mean, nowadays, that's not a real possibility, but in those days, it was something that could happen. So back in the uh, late 70s. Uh, are there any uh, artists or films that inspired you to get into animation? Well, uh, actually, like I said, I, uh, I, well, I didn't say it, I guess, but uh, I had no intention of getting into animation. So um, I, you know, have since, once I got in, started to learn a lot about it and find people to like and emulate or whatnot. Uh, the, I do remember before I got the job offer, coincidentally, I had just taken a girlfriend while I was in high school to go see Wizards. And I thought that was really interesting and unique because up until then it had just been Disney movies and stuff. So uh, Wizards was uh, kind of eye-opening in a lot of ways and I, Ironically, that was uh, the person who hired me, Ralph Bakshi, uh, a little bit later. So how did that so, come about? Um, well, I was in high school, as I said, and I was uh, getting my portfolio ready to submit, or starting to get my portfolio ready to submit to art schools, mostly uh, a place called Art Center in Pasadena. Uh, it was where I was intending to go. and. Uh, my teacher saw my art teacher, who was sort of advising me as much as she could, that she saw a, um, a an ad in a trade newspaper, probably Variety or something like that, looking for portfolio submissions. So she thought it would be a good way f to force me to put a portfolio together and to get a professional review and maybe take a little of the wind out of my sails a little bit and show me that I wasn't all that wonderful. Unfortunately, she had no experience with a lot of that uh, culture. So she didn't know that, A, I, no one gives a portfolio review on a submission like that. So that wasn't going to happen. And B, I ended up getting a job, so it didn't really take any wind out of my sails. <laughs> so so uh, I, that, that happened later when I saw the other talent that was there and realized that I wasn't that spectacular. I was just a high school kid. But they, uh, the high school uh, pitched in and helped me, and they arranged for me to take it uh, the rest of my senior year through adult education and get and graduate with the class and stuff. So That's cool. from there, it was just all, you know, not smooth sailing, but sailing at least. <laughs> so how did how did Ralph Bashke discover Back you? She. Back she, sorry. How did he discover you? Or well, he, he uh, like I said, it was a portfolio submission and. He was hiring tons and tons of people at that point. He was working on Lord of the Rings, uh, the animated Lord of the Rings, before yes. Peter Jackson's, obviously. And uh, he was looking for a lot of hands that could help do uh, work on you know, scut work and whatnot. And as it turned out that as we were uh, doing that, I'd find, you know, I'd get the work done and be available for something. And as he was coming up with a new idea, or needed someone else to do something else, 
I tended to be available. So from doing working on orc eyes and horns or whatever it was and feet and stuff, I went to uh, work, start learning to in between for a um, one of the actual animators there on one of the upper floors. And then I uh, from there, uh, Ralph gave me a uh, massive hundred foot scene of uh, uh, Gandalf and Aragorn riding horses to do. And, from, you know, that was my first actual scene. I kind of did it in between jobs for the uh, animator I was working for and slowly but surely got it done. And, you know, from there, it was, uh, I, I continued on. From there, he, he started giving me more and more work. So, yeah. Did you like working for him? Yeah, and we got along very well. I, you know, I know there are some people that don't, but I, I vibed with him very well. And, you know, I kind of saw him as sort of a uh, father figure uh, when he was in his saner moods and stuff. But, you know, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I stayed with him off and on whenever he had work to do. You know, I, from there, I worked on Hey Good Looking and American Pop with him and also... Um, uh, uh, Fire and Ice was a big one. Um, I was the animation director on Fire and Ice and the key animator. And I also worked with him on Cool World years later and whatnot. So, so I, anytime he had something to do, I'm more than glad to drop everything and go work with him. So. All right. Uh, among the other studios you've worked for, you've also worked for Disney? Yeah, I worked for Disney for a few years. Uh, not the good years. But uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, right before the good years, uh, you know, I worked on Black Cauldron and Great Mouse Detective and a little bit on Oliver and Company. And uh, at that time, it kind of looked like the doors were being shuttered and they were sh closing up shop and whatnot. So several of us that could found other places to go. And, you know, little did we know that it was actually going to suddenly turn into something bigger and better. So, yeah. Uh, uh, and then looking at uh, your uh, resume, you've also worked for Disney at other points. Well, you're at Disney TV. Yeah, I, I did a lot of work for Disney TV and uh, you know, worked on Gummy Bears and a lot of those, uh, uh, I forget what they call them, but they had like an afternoon of things with Chip and Dale and uh, Bonkers and Gummy Bears and yeah. several other shows, DuckTales and whatnot. I, I did. Well, I learned to storyboard, and I started working on those as a storyboard artist. You know, oftentimes, just freelancing it for them. And uh, you also worked for. You also worked with uh, Fox Animation. Yeah, I uh, worked on what was uh, finally turned into Titan AE. I worked on. Um, well, before Titan AE, I did some work. Uh, Anastasia, I animated on Anastasia a little bit freelance remotely for uh, Don Bluth. On that, I did several scenes. And then from there, I got hired to do, um, before it became a Don Bluth film, I worked on what was then called Planet Ice, which eventually turned into Titan AE. So I was doing storyboards on Planet Ice for a while and then left to go somewhere else. I don't know where uh, I'd have to look at my resume. <laughs> so what was Don Bluth like to work for? I'd never worked with him. It, it was remotely. And at, on Anastasia, from what the only connection I had with him is he would make videos telling people how to draw the characters. And um, I would be handed out the scenes from sequence directors or from Gary Goldman who worked with him. And I don't think I ever had any interaction with Don at all. So, mm -hmm. In fact, I think I had just uh, a few months ago, I finally met him. You know, Gary Goldman and him were both at some comic convention that I was also tabling at. And so Gary introduced me to Don. So, huh. yeah. uh, is there any, uh, is there anything you've worked on that you wish more people were aware of? Um, well, I don't know. The, the, the things that uh, my fans seem to like best, like I said, are uh, Swan Princess, and that seems to have a huge following, and X-Men Evolution has a big following. And that's where, uh, in fact, if you talk to uh, 
especially young women at comic conventions, that was usually their first foray into superhero lore and stuff. <laughs> um, that's kind of because it was very soap opera and stuff and kind of got them interested in it. Uh, but, you know, I also, you know, Fire and Ice seems to be very popular amongst fans and stuff. And, you know, it's, uh, yeah, I'd say, you know, I've got several things that seem to do well. I don't know. I can't think of anything offhand. Um, you know, I worked on the Ultimate Avengers when it was a, an animated movie mm -hmm. before the whole MCU started. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know. <laughs> it's hard to say. I, I, I've never thought of that question about what I wish someone would know more about something. Yeah, I, yeah. I asked because, like, uh, Trevor and I were, like, one of the five people who saw the show uh, Kaijudo, and when we've talked to people who worked on it, they were like, finally, someone who watched it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I don't think I've had... I mean, there, there was a show that I directed on her, uh, years and years ago, a couple of decades ago, called um, uh, Pigs Next Door, that I thought was a really good show. It was a uh, using pigs to stand in for uh, ethnic minorities and stuff. And they moved into a, a human neighborhood and everyone was having issues with them for one reason or another. And I thought that was a real good show. It was based on a comic strip, I guess. And I guess it was only released in Germany. So <laughs> that, that would have been nice for more people to have seen because I thought it, it, for a adult themed show like that it was uh really solid and stuff it had john goodman and jamie lee curtis in it wow. a lot of uh, you know main power stars during the voices on it but for some reason they couldn't make the deal or didn't want to make the deal here so in america i don't think it's ever shown i think you can find some of it on youtube somewhere but um so from the uh duties that you've had uh across your career uh what are the what are the duties of a lead character designer well the times i've been character designer i've pretty much been the only character designer so <laughs> lead someone. it's usually a very small thing plus I, I tend to be pretty quick about it uh so we usually don't need many you know during x-men evolution we kept trying to hire others to help and that didn't it never worked out as what because i'd spend a lot more time correcting their stuff than <laughs> i would if i started redoing it or doing it myself to begin with usually i think what uh, next in evolution what i finally had was just a uh, a cleanup person that would take my drawings and put a pretty line around it and make it and animation drawing wise uh it, but as a character designer usually what i do and have done is I uh, you know talk to the producer I, or directors or whatnot usually the producer find out what they're thinking and then I just go off and do a bunch of different versions of things um, and try to find something that connects with them and, but I something that I like too I you know I don't show them stuff I don't like um, because then I might find myself having to do it over and over and yeah. <laughs> it's not, that, that's not fun. Who wants to draw stuff you don't like? Yeah, no. yeah. A lot, a lot of times uh, when I, you know, I'll show different versions, and they're say, "Gee, I like the head from this, and the body from this, and you know." So I, you know, Frankenstein it together, and that type of thing. But you know, and then from there, once you have a basic design, usually a three-quarter drawing of the character, then I'll go off and do expressions for them, do a range of expressions so the animators or the uh, storyboard artists know what they look like in certain moods and stuff. And then I might even do some uh, attitudes, which are, you know, body poses and stuff. So just to show how their body would move under circumstances and whatnot. So that's pretty much what I've been, how I've handled character design anytime I've been given the job. So. Right. Uh, so I was also going to ask like, uh, as a show goes on, like a TV series goes on and it's introduced new characters. So then uh, when a new character is introduced, were you given any sort of direction before you started working on that character? Uh, well, it depends. Well, like, let's use X-Men Evolution as an example, which is probably the longest TV show that I did characters on. Yeah. Um, once they were established, the main characters were established, then the others kind of fell into place a little bit. It was easier to kind of know where to go with them. 
Uh, for example, on X Men Evolution, Rogue was the one that kind of helped us establish what the idea and our thinking was going to be because we completely changed her from what the comic books were and the original series was before. Uh, and once we understood that, yeah, you know, this is where we're going and we got approvals from everyone or indifference from other people and uh, they didn't care what we were doing. So uh, we knew that, okay, at this point we can do pretty much what we want to do. Um, on X-Men Evolution, the only uh, stipulations from Marvel were, because at this time, at that time, Marvel was basically a toy company. They were not they were doing comics and stuff too, but they were licensing and they, they were owned by Toy Biz, which mm -hmm. was, uh, if you're familiar with those, uh, used to sell them at KB and stuff, the little, I don't know, um, six inch or seven inch tall things. That, that was Marvel at that point. They were looking to make toys. Even from the features and stuff, that was their whole goal. There was to make toys at that point. Um, and the only stipulation we were given was that they wanted to have them fit their normal colors. You know, like Wolverine had to be in browns or oranges or something. They, they were really adamant that he had to be orange. And, and that they wanted something about his hair to look similar, even though we lopped off his mutton chops and stuff. Um and, uh, you know, Gene uh, had to have green and Kitty had to have blue and powder blue and, you know, uh, Cyclops had to have yellow in his uniform. Yeah. Yeah. So there was stuff like that. And I think the only other thing they stipulated was that they, they we were having a little trouble finding a saber tooth design that everyone liked. And so they said, well, why don't you try an overcoat on him? because they said, we, we, that's what we're doing in the feature. And they wouldn't let us see anything about the feature at that point. But they said, but he's got an overcoat on. So, you know, I knew I had to put, at least try an overcoat. And so I came up with something that has no bearing on the feature whatsoever, other than he's got an overcoat. So, <laughs> but everyone seemed happy enough with it. So, but after that, you know, when, once we started getting into the further seasons and stuff, especially on characters like um, Boom Boom. Um, we, 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 and we tried a couple of different things that none of us liked, and we went f and found a different version of her that everyone seemed happy with. But uh, Wanda was the one that kind of set another precedent. She, her, Rogue and Wanda were kind of the big ones in our universe at that point where we, we, did, we made her real emo and you know, gave her a real nasty, dark, you know, crazy feeling to her. I mean, in fact, I think uh, we were the first ones, I believe, that did that. She did something wrong with Wanda type of idea. Up until then, she'd just been kind of a minor villain or hero, depending on what comic she was in and stuff. And nothing was unique about her other than she had a weird twin brother. Yeah. yeah. And on our show, we, we did the whole, she's in a straitjacket and she lops off her hair out of anger and, you know, kind of went further with her and kind of pushed that whole, uh, gee, she's a witch and we're pushing it into that range where she's got issues and where she's, you know, wearing sort of a lot of the accoutrements of witchy, witchery and, you know, she's got that whole look going on her, that evil dark look to her. So, uh, How much did you rely on the comic books at all for the designs or did you just very little yeah very little um and which was nice because I, to be honest i had not been you know when i was a kid in the 60s i was you know i bought the kirby and stan lee x-men so i knew all about them i knew about the, the original core members of it but i did not know anything about wolverine or any or didn't know who Beast was. For all I knew, he was another version of Wolverine. <laughs> you know, I, I, you know yeah. I didn't know anything. So I had to learn as we as I went, um, which I think was good because I had no, you know, sacred cows or anything that I was concerned with. You know, I just, you know, I, I was not a big fan of the look of the previous show. So I didn't want, I purposely went a complete different direction than they did. 
and made it more animatable looking because obviously I was an animator, so I knew what was animatable. And also I just didn't like that whole um, staying that tight to the comics. Um, and um, so yeah, there were there are a few characters that we, we veered closer to when we couldn't come up with anything like the original Mystique in our show. We, you know, it was very close to the comic look. And we were never happy with it, but we'd run out of time, and so we went with it. And, you know, there's certain characters like that, that, you know, Storm was probably a little bit closer to the comic book look than we would have done if we'd had more time to re play with her and stuff. So. How, how much time do you do you have to come up with the characters on the show? Or does that depend on the show, I would assume? It, it depends on the show. In this particular case, we didn't have a ton of time. It was a very... Uh, short ramp up i think we probably have it maybe a couple of months maybe mm -hmm. which is short time for a show like that yeah. especially that magnitude and stuff um so there were times where like i said we just said okay well we need something let's do the go backwards and do this instead of thinking up something further and and also in our particular show what we did take further was their um, civilian aspects that was our main goal. The, the costume aspects we weren't as concerned with. We were much more concerned with the civilian looks and stuff because we knew that we wanted to go in that direction where it was less about superheroes fighting each other and uh, characters relating to one another. So that was our main thing. So more time was spent on that than on their uh, uniforms and such. So, mm -hmm. you know, on some shows you get a lot more time and, um, you know, I think on uh, Ultimate Avengers, but that was a direct-to-video movie, so there was more time develop spent developing all those characters and stuff. So than there were on X-Men Evolution, kind of had to hit the ground pretty much running at that point. In fact, when we were first crewed up, the producer had hired me and two other directors to work on it, and the, we hadn't really we hadn't made any decision about who was doing character design at that point, and everyone was kind of throwing stuff out there. And just, I think by sheer, uh, I think when I did the uh, drawing for Rogue, that suddenly locked it in for everyone and said, okay, well, he's, can can you do the character designs as well as do directing? And I was able to manage both of the jobs for a better price, of course. But still. <laughs> uh, since we're already uh, talking about X-Men Evolution, do you mind if we ask you uh, some questions specifically about that? Sure. I, I can't guarantee I'll remember everything. Right. Um, right, so uh, I'll also just say uh, that was X-Men Evolution was the X-Men series uh, that Trevor and I saw growing up. And uh, sure. so that's our that's our uh, favorite X-Men series. And uh, Excellent. Good choice. <laughs> and uh, to some extent to us, that kind of is X-Men. <laughs> because uh, Whenever we were looking at other X Men media, we end up defaulting to thinking about that show. <laughs> Good, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I, I think that's the case for a lot of people probably around your age too. I think you know it's what they grew up with, and I think it's also what, like I said, you, you go to the comic cons prior to, uh, you know, a few years prior to X Men Evolution. It, it was pretty much just male territory. If you go to those comic cons, it, yeah. there were very few women floating around. And I think X Men Evolution is sort of the tipping point where girls suddenly start getting into it. They realize that there was backstories and interactions and relationships between these characters. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. So your art style on the show is very distinctive and expressive and very animation friendly. Thank uh, you. What would you say uh, influenced the style that you used? Well, um, you, uh, almost everything I've worked on kind of influenced it. You know, it, it was definitely a Disney vibe to a lot of the uh, faces and stuff. Um, yeah. And we wanted to avoid the uh, Batman look of the characters. You know, the Bruce Timm designs where, you know, big upper bodies and little legs and stuff. And so we, we purposely tried to veer away from that because that was kind of the thing at the time that was the most popular show and designs 
uh, of the world at that time. And so we wanted to kind of stay clear away from that. We didn't, and a personal thing that I had and uh, the producer uh, as well, um, didn't, didn't want them to be all cookie cutter. I mean, right. a lot of shows, every character, you take off the uniform and they look the same. Yeah. Um, and we wanted to have individuals. And that actually kind of uh, worked for me once I started looking at Adam Hughes's work. I don't know if you're familiar with him, comic book artist. Yeah. He, he was doing a bunch of uh, group shots on like Wizard covers. Wizard was a magazine at the time. And... It'd have a group shot of all the Marvel women or all the DC women, and every single one of them had a distinctive face that was you, you could recognize the type of face it was and stuff, but none of them looked alike. And so that definitely helped influence my thinking because up until then, a lot of animation was sort of, you know, you, you just take that same body and you stick a new uniform on it. You know, you, you see that a lot in, in a lot of those animated shows and stuff, and. It was usually the simplest, cheapest way to go, but we didn't want to do that. We wanted to make sure every character was very distinctive. So, yeah, they also have like unique silhouettes. Yes, yeah, the silhouettes definitely. Yeah, you know, and, and you know, it, it's it was uh, if you look at, I mean, now I kind of fudge it a lot when I uh, do commissions and stuff, but uh, back in the day, you know, originally designed, there every character had a slightly different body type. I mean, you know, like Rogue had larger a larger chest and uh, so, than Jean, and uh, Kitty had no chest, and uh, some car- you know, Boom Boom had a bigger arse, and you know, th- they all had slightly different aspects to them. You know, yeah. longer waist or short. You know, and same with the men; they all had slightly different bo- builds and stuff. So, you know, we wanted to make it unique in that that you could tell each character who they were probably just from the silhouette ideally so um we actually saw a tweet from uh animator harry partridge where he said uh toad's design was uh bordered perfection (laughs) oh really i I don't know who that guy is but i think he's definitely one of my favorite animators (laughs) (laughs) he's got good opinions right yeah um Right, so we want to ask uh, certain questions that we're not sure uh, character designers have been asked. Uh, who was your favorite character to design? Well, um, it, well, it, to design is different than who is my favorite character, I guess. But I think, like I said, Rogue, when I kind of cracked that yeah. look, that kind of helped set off the entire thing for me so i think she'd be my favorite as far as the design but then you know i also really liked design coming up to the design of wanda and apparently uh marvel did too because if re- you reuse that look several times for other characters too if you look at uh um when they had i think it was the second x-men movie or something where they had gene freaking out going for old phoenix and stuff she's basically in wanda's uniform hmm. So, you know, with the long red coat and uh, the the whole uh, look and stuff. And they've, they've used that a few times, even uh, if you look at um, yeah, the original Wanda in the new MCU, when she first shows up, she's kind of dressed like Wanda does in her civvies a little bit with the red leather jacket and such. So, and the vest and whatnot. Anyway, but uh, yeah, I'd say Rogue. If I had to pick one character that was my favorite des- design, but you know, the, you know, all of them were fun to design to one degree or another. Like Nightcrawler was always fun. I mean, coming up with him, working out the fact that his legs work more like, like animal legs instead of like they do in the comics, which are just like weird toes yeah. and stuff. <laughs> you know, stuck on the bottom of his legs. You know, I, I actually gave them the his animal anatomy and um, you know. And Beast was fun because of the gorilla aspect to him that yeah. he put in. So, you know, they, a lot of them were fun to do. So, uh, was there any uh, design that you found uh, particularly easy or difficult to come up with? Um, well, 
Wanda seemed to lay out pretty quickly because that was, you know, further, you know, the, I guess that was season two. By that point, Wanda came very easily. And also, we, we or at least I leaned into, uh, um, I can't think of her name now, the uh, actress that was in The Craft um, to, for a inspiration. And I can't think of her name, I'd have to look it up, but... Um, Anyway, so she kind of came very easily, and and every I don't think there was a lot of back and forth on her. I think she she got the first thing I drew was pretty much approved on her. So, and you know, several of the other characters were like that. I think um, a lot, you know, um, the Brotherhood. Um, some of the Brotherhood were pretty easy and didn't take a lot of futzing around with, as well as. Um, my version of Gambit and Colossus and stuff. They, they all started to come pretty easily. But, of course, part of the thing was is we were running at that point. <laughs> we didn't have a lot of time to futz around. And, yeah. and so I don't know if, that, if we'd had more time, whether or not that would have impacted the design or not, or if you know, we had more breathing room or not. But we had to kind of hit the ground running and keep going. Uh, is there any character you wish you could have designed differently? Yeah, uh, yeah, Storm. I think I would have liked another crack at and uh, Mystique. I mentioned earlier, and w with Mystique, we did get several more cracks at. <laughs> you know, at the end of season one, we did something with her, and we made her kind of like a bodybuilder, and then decided we didn't like that in going into season two. So we came up with another design that we were a little happier with, uh, in their black leather uh, outfit and stuff. Um, yeah, you know, I'm not sure I was com completely satisfied even with that, but still, it was a. I think it was better. Um, yeah, Storm, we I never got to doing much more with. You know, once she was designed, she was designed. Uh, I would have liked to have had another crack. I think with uh, Magneto. I think, um, but you know, a certain point, yeah, you got to just let it go and keep going. Yeah. So. Uh, is there a character that you just like to draw for fun? Well, I don't know about for fun, but if, if someone comes up to me at a con and asks me to do a little quick sketch in their autograph book or something like that, I will usually just do a very simple drawing of Wolverine. He's very simple to draw, you know, with the very basic shapes and stuff. And, you know, I can kind of knock that out without too much sweat. So I don't feel like I've been... Uh, I've given away anything for free. <laughs> <laughs> He's also a very iconic character. Yeah, so. yeah yes. It, it, well, yeah, people don't argue with getting a drawing of Wolverine. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's not an issue. It's not like I'm giving him a drawing of some obscure character that they've never heard of. <laughs> yeah, he was the, th the third row back. You didn't see that? <laughs> yeah. uh, do, you, do you have a favorite character from the show? Yeah. Uh, if I had to choose, I, I thought Boom Boom was a fun character. I thought she had a lot of uh, a personality and a lot of stuff we could do with her. We did a little bit, and I think we could have done even more, but anytime she was used, I think it was a, a fun thing. I mean, I like her uh, her origin episode, yeah. the one where we, you find out where she's from and whatnot, and I also think the one where she was kind of the one of the instigators on uh, the um, uh, Wild, wild side, where uh, the girls on the wild side are uh, Bayville Sirens, I guess yeah. it's called. Yeah, yeah, you know, and that, you know, she, she had a lot of juice in her. I think. I think we could have done even more with her. Now, I like Wander a lot as far as the, the whole crazy, you know, trying to control her craziness and stuff. I thought that was good, and obviously, uh, Marvel did too. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um. Oh, the. Uh... X Men Evolution also in introduced uh, Laura or X twenty three. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what was the design process for her like? Well, that was uh, a lot simpler than you'd think because the creator Craig Kyle, you know, he was at that point, I believe, the producer or one of the producers of the show. Yeah, uh, and it was his idea from the beginning. Um. And he based it on his fiance's niece, 
So he even had her dressed up in basically the outfit he thought she should wear. And, you know, she had like, you know, plastic knives or something between her fingers or whatever and stuff. You know, so he, I was sent a bunch of photos of what he thought she should look like. And I basically uh, followed that pretty closely. You know, uh, you know, obviously I had to make it animatable. And yeah. Get, I, I strove to try to make her look similar in, in many ways to Logan. You know, gave her the same nose and those types of things. So that it looked like she could have been his clone. Yeah. But that that was a relatively simple job. He, you know, he'd even, you know, sent me photos of his fiance because he wanted her to be the doctor that was uh, involved <laughs> in that episode. <laughs> so, so, so it was a very personal episode for him. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. She was, that was uh, the episodes that she was in are very interesting. Yeah. Was... Yeah. It was. It, and no one at that point had any idea that it was anything more than just uh, Craig having a little fun. Yeah. I mean, no, no one knew that suddenly she's going to be the big deal that she turned into. I, I don't think he imagined that, but you know, maybe he had that type of forethought. I don't know, but we sure did. We we thought it was actually kind of a little goofy, <laughs> but you know, like okay, well, you know, whatever, you know. Yeah. Then she went on to be then. Yes. And- games like Marvel versus Capcom 3 and then she was in Logan. Yeah, you know, she yeah, she well, you know, she had a big run of comics and she yeah. even became Wolverine at one point, I believe. But, yeah, you know, there, there's a there's a I mean, they definitely uh they found a character that they could use a lot. So for him impressing his girlfriend. Uh. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I'm not sure if the street prostitute idea was uh, too favorable. <laughs> I'm not sure if he liked that so much, but you know, but he he helped write a lot of the comics with uh, uh, his co-writer, um, and I'm blanking on his name. I'm awful with names. Okay. But anyways. Um, but, yeah. Then after X Men Evolution, he also worked on Wolverine and the X Men. Yeah, I was basically just one of the directors on that. Uh, yeah, I, I did help a little bit with uh, design, but mostly I was doing expressions and attitudes on that those characters. Someone else had designed them because we, I came on, and you know the whole crew actually came on after a lot of the development work had been done. We replaced the crew on that show, and so we were just there, you know, pulling it all together and making it work. Um, but yeah, as far as design work, I had very little input other than if I needed a character, I would talk to the character designer and tell them what I was looking for and stuff. But I didn't do a lot of original designs at that point. So, uh, what were your duties as a director? Mostly it was, um, you know, I'd work, I'd hand out, I'd break down the script, hand it out to storyboard artists, get back their roughs and give them notes and go back and forth a couple of times with them. And then I would build an animatic, which is basically a, uh, a reel of a footage reel that sh- but with the storyboards, you know, so that you'd get an idea of what the pacing is and what the, how long you stay on certain cuts and whether or not there's stuff that you have to add or change or alter or whatnot. You know, so basically before it goes overseas to animation and color, They've got a finished work reel and stuff to look for, look at and stuff. So for timing and whatnot. So. Uh, since uh, Wolverine and the X Men had multiple directors, uh, how are duties divided between them? Uh, well, the producer and it's the same. It was the same on um, X Men Evolution and almost every series. It's rare that a series has one director. Yeah. Um, it'd have to be a pretty short series to pull that <laughs> off. If, you, if you've got, you know. You know, 10, 13 or something episodes, you're going to need more than one director because they, they otherwise you'd be on it forever. Yeah. Um, so in that case, what happens is the producer, he goes in and decides he's going to do what what episodes. And usually it's a rotation thing. It's like you, you'd get every third episode if there's three directors. And sometimes it move episodes around to make sure you got a good one that worked for your sensibilities or such. But a lot of times it was just whatever came up. Yeah, you know, I've done that on several shows, including, uh, um, you know, Avengers or Spiniest Heroes and, 
even Ultimate Avengers, I was one of two directors on that movie. Um, but you know, it, even now I'm, I'm doing directing on the show, and I'm one of three directors. <coughs> oh, excuse me. You, you talked about your duties as director going up until when it goes overseas for it to be animated and colored. Do you have post? It de well? de depend. You very rarely at that point they usually bump the the directors off, okay. y and you know, offload them, so that and usually it's the producer who's left there with a, a small crew. And they go through stuff when it comes back in. Okay. Uh, sometimes they will keep if you're rolling over into a new season immediately. They will keep you obviously to do the directing on season two, and then you're be able to look and work on the stuff when it comes back in. But usually there's a gap between seasons, and so they will usually try to uh, eliminate the extra expense of having you sitting there <laughs> waiting, waiting for stuff to come in unfortunately but that's you know that's a cost you know cost uh, cost cut and stuff so does the director get involved with the voice acting at all sometimes yeah it, uh, on a it depends on who, what the show is and how it's being voice acted it, usually if it's uh, being voice acted here there's more of a chance of it happening but it, a lot of times there's so many people in the, the booth kibitzing on the voice acting that it can get a little difficult. Uh, in X-Men Evolution, it was all done via phone line because it was mm -hmm. um, uh, voice acted in Canada to save costs mm -hmm. and stuff. So uh, it, it can, uh, you know, ideally the director does involve themselves, but it's not necessary. You know, because like I said, a lot of times there's the producer, the supervising director, a writer, you know, there's all types of people in there already giving notes and suggestions and stuff. And in the meantime, you've got to keep your show, your episodes that you've got already rolling. You got to keep those plates spinning, too. So, you know, it, it, you could lose a whole afternoon if you're not careful. So. Um, of the... Uh different uh i guess you could say hats you've worn in the industry is there any uh sort of role that you've enjoyed having over another well i like directing i, I prefer that over storyboarding um but you know that's not often available so i'll storyboard uh i also like doing character design and you know and i love doing 2d animation not a lot of opportunities these days for that you know, I uh, was an animator on Space Jam 2, so it was fun. I was able to do that for, uh, you know, I don't know, that was six months or something, six or nine months or something. That, but it'd be nice to, I'd love to do more animation. I did some animation for a friend of mine, Andreas Deja, on a short that he's making. Uh, and I did some animation on that. And that was real fun because it was, unlike Space Jam 2, which was digital animation, you know, you'd work on a Cintiq with digital yeah. programs even though it was still done by hand his he wanted all done by paper with paper and pencil in the traditional way so that was real fun that was nice to do again that and done that in decades so <laughs> um has uh covid affected how you work in the industry or any part of your artistic artistic process uh yes and no i mean i've always worked at home a lot on many projects in fact uh seasons three and four of x-men evolution i was working somewhere else at the time dreamworks and i was working freelance doing the character designs on that show those up uh, seasons i wasn't one of the directors at that point because i'd taken another job somewhere else in between seasons and couldn't quit so i've always worked at home and always maintained a office with the equipment I need and whatnot. So it has, what's changed is now I don't have to go in at all. And I, all the jobs I've had since COVID have always, you know, I've been at home, obviously. Nothing's changed so far. No one's asked me to go in yet. Right. So I've been able to uh, you know, work exclusively at home, which is nice. It allows me to uh, kind of run my own hours and, you know, get up early, finish early or whatever, or work late. 
So it's um, it, so it's been nice. I've I've liked it. You know, some people I know can't, don't like working at home, uh, but I've always been a big fan of it. So, um, from your experience, is there a difference between working on an original IP and an existing one? And do you have a preference? Um, no, uh, you know, uh, because none of them are my IP. So, it, you know, it's always someone else's, regardless of whose. Yeah. Whether it's an existing one or someone else, you come up with an original and I'm still working on someone else's idea. So uh, it, it is, if you're working on an, a feature, it, it's fun often, you know, a big feature like at DreamWorks or Disney or something like that, because you're actually developing the story most of the time. Even if there is a script at one point, you're, you're actually working up the story and you're coming up with things and stuff. You know, it's sort of being rewritten in storyboard. So that's a different thing altogether. And that's always fun. So, um, Speaking of features, uh, we noticed on your resume, you mentioned uh, Wonder Park. And uh, that, <laughs> that has a that had a uh, rough development, to say the least. Yeah, I, yeah. We the the situation there is, I was at on at Paramount working on a SpongeBob movie that ended up getting shelved. But while it was being rewritten at one point, they said, you know, why don't all the storyboard artists go over here and work on Wonder Park? Um, and I don't think it was called Wonder Park. It was called a a park or amusement park at that point. Yeah. And uh, so uh, at that point, most everything had been set and settled and discussed and screamed about and whatnot. Uh, you know, we tried to add our input, but anything we'd say usually ended up being, oh, we already thought of that. We, we can't do that. <laughs> so, so basically, we, we were kind of uh, just... Uh, pairs of hands helping out on it and stuff. It, it, there was not a lot of ownership to it. Mm -hmm. you know, we were just helping them wrap it up and finish it and stuff. So before we went back over and worked on um, the, the, the SpongeBob movie that eventually got shelved. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, since this is also this is a uh, comics, generally a comic scene podcast, I wanted to also ask about your work in comics. Okay. Um, um, go ahead. Uh, we've noticed you've uh, worked on uh, stuff related to Edgar Rice Burroughs' work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, when I was a kid, I was a big fan of uh, Burroughs. I read all the books and such, so it was kind of fun to get a chance to actually do some Tarzan stuff. Um, I did a, uh, there was a book based on Jungle Tales of Tarzan, which is kind of like adventures, a bunch of, a group of adventures of when he was young. So I actually got to do one of the stories, uh, illustrate one of the stories. And then from there, I was also worked on a uh, online comic strip for the Eternal Savage, which was a, um, it, it didn't feature Tarzan, but he was in it. Tarzan and Jane were in it and stuff. So that was kind of fun to do. And, uh, you know, you still wouldn't mind doing some more borough stuff somewhere in the future, time permitting and cost permitting and stuff, so. Okay. Um, do you have a dream project that you've worked on or would want to work on or? Well, I mean, there, there's something that I've been trying for, for a long time to get going. And it was, uh, a project that I at one point had the option on and then someone else, I had the option on for animation and was getting close to getting it realized, but it was very adult oriented, uh, mature. And, and I don't mean with sex or anything, but it was right, very, right. very, you know, adult themed and stuff, which yeah. is nothing unusual these days. Yeah. But in, in, you know, 10 years, 15 years ago, very unusual, you know, people were, you know, I took it to um, Sony at the time, and they were. This is before uh, Hotel Transylvania, the first movie and right. stuff, and they they liked it, but they said, "Can you make it more family oriented?" And I said, "No." <laughs> <laughs> the the fans of the book wouldn't uh, appreciate it, so I uh, did not. You know, they did not give me a call back. <laughs> so, 
Um, but you know, it, that's one of those things that keep, yeah, I keep, keep my uh, Google alerts for when you know people are talking about it and stuff. And, you know, it, it's been developed for live action a couple of times. And that, that's what killed my option is that someone off, offered to do it in live action and they went with it. Um, and that fell through and then someone else is trying to do it as a mini series and that's fallen through. And so I kind of keep my ears open for it to see if there's any chance of getting back to it. What, but what, we'll see. Can you tell us what the book is? Yeah, it was a Stephen King book. Um, it was, uh, I don't know how familiar you are with Stephen King, but it was Eyes of the Dragon, right. which was sort of a medieval fantasy fairy tale type book that he wrote, you know, years and years ago for his kids when they were little right so but yeah it's you know it, it, you know we've done a lot of development for it and got things moving but like i said you know it wasn't fast enough to lock it down to get the money at that point like i said we, we could always find someone who was willing to give us extra money but no one who wanted to give us what they call first money right. and without the first money the, no one will give you the extra money until you get the first money. Yeah. So there's a lot of catch 22 going on. <laughs> and, and at that point, you know, a lot of the studios are saying, Oh yeah, this would be great. We just don't want to be the first one to, to try it, something like this. And now it would be a no brainer. Yeah. So yeah. And unfortunately it's not in my hands this moment, but you know, maybe someday, you know, it will fall back into it. I don't know. We'll see. But that, that's kind of the one that got away. So, um, do you have any personal projects of your own? Not, you know, I've been frankly so busy that I don't have a lot of time for that type of thinking. Right. Um, you know, I've worked on some miscellaneous things and things with other people and as the illustrator and stuff like, a, you know, comic book wise, I've worked on something called uh, Headhunter for a group called Sit Comics that was pretty popular the first few issues. And, you know, we're trying to get together a second uh, graphic novel or I don't know if it's graphic novel, but it was like a bundle of three. And that, that's kind of uh, languished a little bit. And currently I'm working with a writer that we and we had started this years and years ago for another publisher. The publisher fell through and collapsed and stuff. So we decided to resurrect it ourselves. And do with European overseas, a, a werewolf project that we're working on. So that's currently one of the things I'm working on. Now, a personal project, it's based on uh, someone else's book from the Pulp Air and stuff. It was one of the first werewolf books and stuff. So, but it's still kind of a personal to me in a way. All right. Uh, if you were to go back and relive your art career, is there anything you would have done differently? Yeah, I wouldn't have left Disney <laughs> right, <laughs> right before they started doing well. And, and at that point, you know, uh, it seemed like I said, it seemed like ah, this is you know, the, you know, Frank Wells before he died was talking about shuttling the whole entire animation unit because he saw. Um, uh, that the re-release of 101 Dalmatians made as much money as any new release that they put out. And he said, what's the point? Just re-release the old, all the old movies. You don't need, you're never going to make any more money than that anyway. And uh, turned out he was wrong before he died. So, but, uh, so I, I think if I'd been smarter, I would have just buckled down and stayed there instead of feeling like, yeah, I can, because at that point, I, I'm like a lot of the animators there who, that was their whole goal in life is to be a Disney animator and yeah. that never worked anywhere else. They came up through the ranks and stuff. I was hired as an animator, which was pretty unusual in those days. And I had an outside life, an outside career, you know, where I, I've worked other places. And so I wasn't beholden to uh, working just at Disney. I, you know, I knew I could find other work and I did, but uh, you know, I probably, if I'd, been smart i would have stayed or once things started kicking in if i'd been smart i probably could have gotten back in if i contacted the right people and i didn't think i didn't think of it at the time so no but other than that things haven't been too bad otherwise so uh since you're uh 
formerly known as a character designer, is there any advice you'd give to someone who wanted to pursue that? Boy, these days, character design can be anything. Um, I mean, my, you know, it used to be that you have to be, had to be a good draftsman and know what you were doing and stuff. Nowadays, if you look at some of the shows out, it's like, yeah, I'm not so sure that's necessary anymore. So I, it's hard to give advice to character designers. If you've got your heart set on being a character designer and you, you've got a look that you think will work, then maybe you just keep pushing it and maybe eventually you're hit on the right person who agrees with you. So, I mean, some producer or something that says, yes, that's the look of my new crazy sitcom TV show or whatever, you know. I mean, who would have thought that uh, something that looked like uh, Adventure Time would be a look? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, do you have any hobbies outside of art? Um, no, not not a lot. <laughs> Reading, uh, film, you know, which is sort of tangent, and so is reading, I guess. But uh, you know, you know, just kind of taking it easy. I'm kind of getting towards the end here. <laughs> you know, I like going to comic cons, but that's sort of tangent too. So. Yeah. So, you know. Uh, I guess the last question here is uh, if someone wanted to follow you, uh, where would they go? Uh, if you Google Stephen E. Gordon, you find a lot of me all over social media. Uh, I'm on Facebook, I've got a, a page, The Art of Stephen E. Gordon. I've got a website, which I assume you've probably been looking at. Yeah. Um, um, also on uh, Instagram, do a lot of posting on Instagram. Stuff, so I'm out there. Stuff, so it's pretty easy to follow me. All right. Any other questions? So. Uh, no, I think that's about it. Uh, right. So, uh, so that's it. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube later and you like this, uh, leave a like. Uh, subscribe if you want to see more. And if you have any comments about uh, what we've discussed here including x-men evolution uh leave a comment below all right so thanks very much for being on the show we really appreciate you taking the time nope my pleasure all right so until next time i'm david hankins i'm paul hankins i'm trevor hankins and you've been on the air with power squared